Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Westwood Christian Church. It's always great to have you worshiping with us uh, today. I am Adam Tomlinson. I'm the minister here. So if we haven't met, please stop and talk to me afterward. I'd love to do that. A couple quick things that I want to point or draw your attention to today. The first is perhaps most obvious. Yes, the communion cups are different today. Um, what we had been ordering, I had reordered. And on Wednesday... Hadn't shipped yet, and I was like, there's no way that's getting here in time. So I very quickly found uh, the, the, the fastest non-sacramental wine prepackaged, because they make that, you know. I don't know how good wine is in a plastic cup, but they make that. Uh, but I had to find whatever I could find on Amazon that would get here in two days. So this is what we've got today. Hopefully we'll get back to the other quieter stuff but anyway, that's why that's different. Wanted you to know that. The other thing I'm going to tell you, for those of you who are regulars here, normally I get up here, I welcome you, I make any you know, pre-service announcements that I need to, and then I step off and we do some scripture reading and then we do some singing. Our service is going to be a little bit different ordered today, um, in part because my sermon today is going to be on the psalm that we are reading together. Um, some of you are going to look at that psalm and go, there's no way this is in the Bible. I promise you it's in the Bible. Uh, but we're going to talk about the psalm today because the last line is kind of yikes. And uh, so we're going to talk about that today. Uh, so the service order is going to be just a little bit different today. Uh, now, the things that are the same. As always, if you, if you have a prayer request that you would like for me or our elders or our church to know about please fill out a connect card. Uh, if you have a prayer request that you would like to keep kind of uh, not on the prayer list, but you would like me and the elders to pray about that, uh, there's, a, there's a, a spot there for you to make a prayer request confidential, and we will keep that just between ourselves. And so I want you to know that we do believe in the power of prayer. We believe, uh, as we'll talk about today, God consoles us. And I believe that prayer is one of the ways in which we call God upon our lives to console and comfort us in the midst of hardship. So uh, with all of that out of the way, I am going to open us in a brief word of prayer. Then we're going to sing some songs. We're going to be uh, led in prayer and then scripture reading. And then I will preach. We will sing some more and join the Lord at the Lord's table. Um, and I am so glad, like I said, that you are here today uh, for worship uh, on this first Sunday in October. Like, holy cow. But nevertheless, almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we are to pray and more ready to give than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ our Savior. It is he who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. We're going to start with singing a song called Christ is Enough. And just reminding us that Christ is enough for everything in our lives. There's nothing 
may be seated. Shall we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, as we sang that song, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. I'm so blessed by that assurance. Pardon for sins. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving us of our sins. And though we're not always faithful to you, you are always faithful to us. And we're so blessed by that. Thank you, Lord, for the beauty of the season that's upon us, the changing of the fall colors. This is so amazing. Your love for us is beyond measure. Father, we pray for the church. We pray for Westwood. May we be your church, Lord. Not our church, but your church. Guide our decisions. Help us to be able to reach out to those around us and share the good news of Jesus and his saving love for us. We pray for those on our prayer list. We think about Nadine, who's in Scalin uh, Rehab um, in Stoughton. Continue to heal her from her shoulder surgery, but she can be able to get home again soon. Thank you for the love and care of her daughters who are ministering to her. We pray for Adam's father and his search for a job. May that be answered soon, Lord, and provide for their needs. There are others who have health concerns. There are spiritual concerns. There are economic concerns. We pray for all of these, and may we be facilitators in terms of helping solve these problems. Guide the rest of our service, be with Adam as he brings our morning message. And may we always serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. For our reading this morning from Lamentations, chapter 1, starting with verse 1. How lonely sits the city that once was full of people. How like a widow she has become, she that was great among the nations. She that was a princess among the provinces has become a vassal. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has no one to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile with suffering and hard servitude. She lives now among the nations and finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her. In the midst of her distress, the roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to the festivals. All her gates are desolate, her priests groan, her young girls grieve, her lot is bitter. Her foes have become the masters, her enemies prosper, because the Lord has made her suffer for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. From daughter Zion has departed all her majesty. Her princes have become like stags that find no pasture, they fled without strength before the pursuer. And in our response reading, uh, the congregation will read the, the bold part. By the waters of Babylon, we sat down and wept. As for our harps, we hung them up. For those who led us away captive asked us for a song, and our oppressors called for mirth. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. 
How shall we sing the Lord's song? If I forgot you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget you still. Let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember the day of Jerusalem, O Lord, against the people of Eden. Who said, down with it, down with it, even to the ground. O daughters of Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. Well, what do we do with that? Right? I mean, some of you are looking at your bulletin like, surely that's not the right translation, right? I promise you, you can go in any, I mean, you go to Bible Gateway. Type in Psalm 137, verse 9, click Add Parallel until it stops giving you options. And every one of those translations is just as graphic as the one that we read today. I mean, what do we do with this passage? This is in our Bible. The Psalms, right, these were, these were put together as songs that the Jews would sing in synagogues. And they are the songs that the early church would sing in their services. Well, what do we do with a song like that? What do we do with a song that says happy or blessed, same word, blessed is the one who throws your children against the rocks? I mean, yikes on bikes, right? I mean, like, what do we do with that? Well, it's my hope that today we'll, we'll maybe make a little bit of sense of it. Uh, we're going to talk about this today. I, I, select, I know that we've been in Jeremiah, right? We've been talking about Jeremiah for the last couple of weeks, and we will revisit Jeremiah. But I felt like in the middle of this kind of series through Jeremiah, it was important to see and to read and to think about the perspective of the people that Jeremiah was talking to. See, what's very interesting about this psalm is this is one of the very few psalms where we know exactly the context of it. Most psalms will say things like, a psalm of David. But if you go back and look, that's all we think. <laughs> Most of the time, we think that was written by David, or we think that was written by the Korahites, or we think something. We, scholars will say, this psalm sounds like it could be written when David was on the run from Saul, which I've always thought was funny. David's in the middle of a cave, huddled against a cold floor, like, what's the tune, right? Is, it, is this in 4-4 or 3-4? Like, what, how do I do this? This is one of the psalms that we have a context for. It begins, By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs, there our tormentors asked us for mirth, that's joy, revelry, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. But how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? You see, the, the, the Israelites who are writing this psalm, they have been exiled. They are not singing about what could happen. They are singing about what is actually happening right now. They have been carted away from their home. They are along the rivers of Babylon, doing whatever work they're supposed to be doing. They hang their harps upon the trees as a way to say, we will not use these while we are in exile. Our hearts are broken. We weep as we remember Jerusalem. Now, the Bible uh, tells us, uh, you can read 2 Kings chapter 25, um, and uh, you can also read like Jeremiah, uh, at, near the end of Jeremiah. Um, we, we have very similar dis descriptions of what the destruction of uh, Jerusalem looks like uh, as Nebuchadnezzar marches his armies in and we're told that he burns every, uh, every building. He burns 
every building and as they make their way through town. They slaughter people as they are marching through town. They get to the temple and they topple its stones. And then we have this, we actually have like this a description of one of the captains, captains of the Babylonian army who, who goes in and he, he, uh, he, he takes these, these gold pillars that are worth a lot of money. You see, the, the people who are, who are writing this psalm, they're some of the few people who weren't killed in the destruction of Jerusalem. They're the people who were marched 2,000 miles. That is how far Jerusalem is from the city of Babylon. They're marched 2,000 miles in pain with the memories of their loved ones and their friends being killed or burned we're beginning to get a sense of what it was like, aren't we? There's, there's, a, diff- there's a passage about a different uh, war. Uh, that is in, uh, <clears throat> it's in 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 12. Uh, th- this is very interesting because while this is not about the siege of Jerusalem, uh, it does give us an insight into the way that cities were overtaken in, the, in this time period because it's not very long before Jerus- Jerusalem falls. Hazael asked, why does my Lord weep? Elisha answered, because I know the evil that you will do to the people of Israel. You will set their fortresses on fire. You will kill their young men with sword, dash in pieces their little ones, and rip up their pregnant women. If you are like me, it's easy to to kind of read the biblical stories of destruction of cities through sterilized eyes, to think about, oh, well, they killed them with the sword. And we just move right along. But here in 2 Kings chapter 8 and in the places where we have this like uh, 2 Kings uh, 25 where we get these very real images of the costs of war, we begin to understand where these psalm writers might be coming from. Because, you see, those are the images that are on their mind. Those are the images that they are dealing with. And what do their captives do? They mock them. Sing us a song. Sing us a song about Zion. Sing us a song about that city that we destroyed. Remember that, guys? Sing us a song about the temple that we've destroyed. Sing us one of those songs that you're so famous for. And the Israelites say, how in the world do you expect us to sing one of those songs while we are exiled? How do you expect us to sing a song while we are in Babylon? How do you expect us to have any kind of joy? It appears, though, that that question is rhetorical. Because the Jews do something remarkable. They grab their harps off the willows. They strum up a chord and they begin to sing. They say, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand uh, wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. Let me be useless if I cannot remember Jerusalem. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. You see, they, they begin to sing they, they, they say, fine, you want a song? We'll sing you a song. We'll sing you a song about how we cannot forget Jerusalem. This is important. Part of the reason that the Babylonians, like other countries, other cultures, by the way, the Assyrians did this, the Romans did this, the Greeks did this, the, the Egyptians did this. I mean, this is a common thing. But what they would do, there was a very specific reason they would conquer you and take you away. Their hope was that they could beat out of you any desire to revolt. They could get out of you any desire to see yourselves as a people group. You're not Israelites anymore. You don't live in Palestine. You live in Babylon. You are our slaves. You are not a people worth caring about. That's what they're trying to do. And so when the Israelites strum up their song, they're resisting the Babylonians. You want a song? We'll give you a song. We're going to tell you how we'll never forget the mountain of our Lord. We're going to tell you how we will never forget the place where David unified our kingdom. We will never forget the place that we worship. We will never forget where you took us from. 
and we will never forget what you did to our people there. Right As they are singing this song, the, we, can, we can almost feel the emotion bubble up. We can feel their pain and their anger and their sadness because they go from remembering Jerusalem to cursing the people who saw Jerusalem fall. Remember, O oh Lord, against the Edomites the day of Jerusalem's fall, how they said, tear it down, tear it down, down to the foundations. O oh, daughter Babylon, you devastator, happy or blessed shall they be who pay you back for what you did to us. Blessed shall they be who take your little ones and dash them upon the rocks. The, the pain of these people is real. It's palpable. We, you know, whatever we are, 2,700 years after this is written, we still feel it, don't we? We can imagine how we would feel in their place. The Edomites, they, 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 they feel kind of like a, a weird addition here if you don't know the story of, Israelite, of, of Israel's fall, of Judah's fall. You see, the Edomites, I will remind you, they are the ancestors of, or the descendants of, sorry, the descendants of Esau, their ancestor. Jacob and Esau are brothers. Jacob is where Israel comes from. Esau is where Edom comes from. These people are cousins. They are family. They both trace their heritage back to Isaac and Abraham. These people are supposed to be on the same team. And the Edomites, on the day of Jerusalem's fall, proclaimed curses upon it. Probably looking out for themselves, right? <laughs> if we're staying with Babylon, maybe they won't take us over. And then, of course, we have the prescription against Babylon. You see, they've, they've asked for a song, and so the Israelites, the Jews, they, they sing a song that punches back. You're going to hit us with mockery? Fine. We will mock you too. He who lives by the sword, they will die by the sword. Blessed shall be the one who pays you back for what you did for us, or to us. Now, by 539 BCE, so 580-something is when the, the Judahites are taken away, when the temple is destroyed. We think it's about 586, 587 BC. So 50-some years later, Persia comes in, and they take over Babylon. There are conflicting stories about how Cyrus the Great took over Babylon. Some say that it was a bloody war. <laughs> Others other descriptions to say that Babylon realized that they were on the decline, and so they gave up rather peacefully. I'm not sure how the Jews would have felt about a peaceful overtake of Babylon, but the point is that Babylon, despite its delusions of grandeur, it will not stand as an empire, not even 60 more years. Babylon itself will fall. It lived by the sword. It will die by the sword. Just as Assyria did before them. Just as the Philistines did before them. Just as Greece and Rome will do after them. None of those empires still exist, do they? We only read about them in history books. Because they lived by the sword and they die by the sword. We can imagine how when the, when the Jews returned home, right? So Cyrus the Great in 539 or whatever, he, he comes in, he takes over Babylon, and he says, okay, so I'm going to be a good emperor. I'm going to send all the people these Babylonians captured, I'm going to send them home. Or at least I'm going to let them go home. Uh, we think that a lot of Jews stayed in Babylon, actually. But, but a number of them go home. This is where we get the books like Ezra and Nehemiah. They are stories of the rebuilding of Jerusalem as they go home after Cyrus takes over Babylon. And we can imagine how for those people, this psalm would have become a song of pride, a song of God's faithfulness. They would sing it in, in generations to come. Remember how they taunted us? Remember how they thought they were better than us? And here we are back home. Yes, it was destroyed, but we are rebuilding it or we have rebuilt it, depending on, you know, whatever they are. This would have been a song that they would have 
held on to, that they would have used as a reminder that God is faithful, that God, through Jeremiah in chapters 49 and 50, Jeremiah had actually prophesied that there would be judgment on Edom and Babylon. And what do you know? It came. It came. So we can see, I think, how this song maybe makes its way in to the Psalter. But what do we do with it today? <laughs> right? Like, we're still left going, I don't, I, don't, I don't think we're supposed to advocate this, are we, Adam? Like, is that what we're saying? Like, the, the action point today is not go home and find your neighbor's baby. That's not the action point today, okay? But what do we do with it? I had to laugh. Uh, in, my, in my preparation for, for this sermon, uh, I will often go back and, and look at, like, how did some of the great preachers in history handle hard texts, right? How, how has the church handled this text throughout history? And so one of the people that I looked at was St. Augustine, who was the bishop in North Africa, and if you ask me, he kind of just is disingenuous with the passage because he says, well, don't, don't forget, Christ is the rock. The confession that Christ is Lord is the rock. So throw your children to Jesus. And you're like, well, dude, I don't think that's what they're talking about. Like, what are you talking about? Like, don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, bring your children to Jesus, but I don't think that's what the Jews are singing about by the rivers of Babylon. Like someday there's going to be a savior and we'll throw our children to him and the children of our enemies, like, no, Augustine, you chicken, you failed to handle the real pain of this passage. And that's what I think, one of the reasons I think this, this psalm has been kept for us. As a reminder that God is bigger than your pain. Look, I... I've been through painful moments of life. Nothing like the Jews. Let me be very clear. Nothing that painful. I've been through pain. And even the little bit of pain that I've been through, it can feel like God's not big enough for this pain. My pain is bigger than God. This psalm says, no, 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 no. Bring your pain to me. Right? Let us not forget that the Psalms were written as songs we sing to God. Right? They weren't intended just to be things that we read during our private time at home, certainly do that, but that wasn't their original goal. Their original goal was to be poems or songs that we sing as a representation of our heart to God. And what this Psalm reminds us is that no amount of pain is too big for God to handle. Bring your pain to God. But this psalm also reminds us that God is big enough to handle our raw emotions. If you're like me, you might feel like, okay, I have to censor my prayers so that they're theologically correct. Right? I have to, I have to make sure that my prayers to God are, are in line with the way that I understand the entire world. And if I'm wrong... I, something bad might happen to me. This psalm says, no, no, no. Don't worry about censoring yourself. Bring your pain to God. Whatever you're going through, bring it to God because he's big enough for it. He invites it. But there's an important thing that these people do. You see, the Israelites, the, the people who write this psalm, they do not say, blessed shall we be when we dash your babies against the rocks. Blessed shall we be when we pay you back. Blessed shall we be when we march into Edom and kick their behinds. They don't say that, do they? They leave the judgment of these people. They leave the judgment against their injustices completely in the hands of God. They leave all of the resolution of their pain in God's hands. God says, bring me your pain. Bring it to me. But, but also, leave it with me. Right? It is okay to be angry, but in your anger, do not sin. Bring me your anger. Bring me your pain. Bring me your weeping. Bring me your tears, Jesus. Or, God says, and then, of course, Jesus will do that even more 
tan, uh, with tangibly. That's the word I couldn't think of. Right? Jesus will say, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In 2 Corinthians, we find this passage <clears throat> In chapter 1, this is right at the beginning of his letter to the Corinthians. Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all consolation, who consoles us in all our affliction so that we may be able to console those who, have, who are in any affliction with the consolation with which we have received. Blessed be God who consoles us. Bring all your pain to God. But again, I, I want to point out that the, 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 the psalm writers, they leave this in the hands of God. God console us. Take care of these Babylonians who treated us so badly. Paul would write in Romans chapter 12, do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take, <clears throat> but take thought for what is noble in sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with everyone. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heat burning coals on their head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Hear me say that those are hard things to do. And perhaps frequently, we have to begin by being angry, even angry at our enemies. Jesus tells us to pray for our enemies. Sometimes we may have to go to God angry at our enemies before the Spirit of God softens our heart that we might pray for our enemies. This is not easy to do. Scripture is very clear, though, that nobody is perfect except for Jesus. That means that you and I have things that might inspire the anger and wrath of others. There are problems in our lives. There are things that we have done wrong. We have sinned. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, says Paul. Isaiah says it this way. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned in our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That is from the suffering servant passages of Isaiah chapter 53. Those passages historically become associated with Jesus, a reminder that you and I, our sin, means that you and I should be dashed against the rocks. But instead of dashing us against the rocks, Jesus has taken our pain, our shame, our sin upon himself and allowed himself to be cast against the rocks on our behalf. Jesus, though, did not stay on those rocks, right? A couple days after he's killed, his disciples go looking for him. They walk into a tomb, and there is a bare rock with linens laid upon it, but no body. Jesus has risen from the rocks. Jesus has promised life to those who follow him. Jesus has, has taken some part, all part, of that punishment that we deserved, has he not? So we remember, God is big enough for our pain. God is big enough for our hurt. God is big enough for our tears. He invites them. He invites us to come and lay them at his feet. But we also remember that just as Christ has taken care of our sin, he also takes care of the sin of others. You see, I think it's okay that we're a little offended by this psalm. That tells us, I think, that our heart's in the right direction. 
that, that we don't pay people back what they've done to us, right? Treat others the way you want to be treated, not the way they've treated you. That's what Jesus says. And so part of what this psalm does is it reminds us that God changes our hearts. But it also reminds me to ask some questions. Who might wish these things upon me? And how do I become a person that doesn't inspire this kind of emotion? As well as the question, where in my life am I an enemy of God? What do I need to repent of? The debt is paid, period. The response of the God-fearer, of the Christian, is to repent. To, yes, repent of our own sin. And while I think God says it's okay to bring these kinds of comments, these kinds of opinions to him, I think God will also ask us to repent of wishing death upon the babies of the Babylonians. You know, I, I think that God would have said, okay, I appreciate you bringing me your raw, unfiltered pain, but as I console you, I hope you will change your heart and love your enemies. Ultimately, <clears throat> I want to end with a passage from 2 Timothy. Do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, or of me, this is Paul, his prisoner. But join with me in the suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given uh, to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Do not be ashamed of your pain. Bring it to God. Do not be ashamed of the way the gospel changes you. Celebrate that reality. Do not be ashamed of the way that the gospel might ask you to suffer for God's purposes. But never forget, Paul says, that death itself has been defeated. That life has been granted through the light of Jesus the Christ. Even in pain, God is faithful. So bring your pain to him. Allow him to show you his faithfulness. I normally close in prayer, but if you all would go ahead and get in place. I think that in response to a psalm like this, in response to a history like this psalm has, in response to what we've talked about today, the best thing that we can do is do what these psalm writers did. Let us stand and we will sing of God's faithfulness. We will sing of the hope that we have in a God who meets us in our pain and promises to transform.
Good morning. Before we partake of the communion meal, I'd like us to think a little bit about what it means to be Christians. People outside the faith look at us and they often think that Christians are members of a church, regular attenders of a church, readers of the Bible, they give tithes and offerings and outreach to those in need our outreach to non-believers, these are not what make us Christians. These actions, these actions should be a natural outgrowth of our belief. Christ is God's son. He came to earth, took on human form, lived among us and died on the cross. But he rose again and he sits even today on the throne with his father. That death, that human form that he took, was to pay for our sins and grant us forgiveness. We need to believe this, and that will wash away our sins. This is what makes us Christians. We need to do our best to follow the example of Jesus' life, and that's what being a Christian means following Jesus. This is all a natural outgrowth of our faith. And communion is a time of remembrance of Jesus' sacrifice for all of us. I'd like to read a few verses from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ 
not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Will you join me in prayer? Dear God, our Lord and our Creator, we're truly thankful for this reconciliation with you. We know we fall so far short of what you'd have us be. Each and every day we sin many times. But help us to do our best to follow the example of your Son and to do his work here on earth. It's in his precious name we pray, Lord. Amen. Will you join me now? Uh, we're back to this older form where I think we peel off first carefully the foil to get to the, whoops, mine didn't come apart right. I know, I got the, there we go. So peel back the, first the plastic part. This bread symbolizes the body of Christ. And this juice represents his blood shed on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Hopefully, next week, we'll have the easier to open ones back, but you know. Uh, this is a good time, though, to say. Um, obviously, we switched to the prepackaged communion back when uh, you know, we were meeting with COVID, being still kind of raging and all those kinds of things. And um, we would like to return at some point soon to, you know, uh, the, 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 the kinds of cups and bread that you all are uh, familiar with, perhaps, uh, from before that time. But, uh, you know, it's been a couple years, and so we kind of need to rebuild the team of people who helps take care of that. And so if you are interested in being someone who helps serve communion, being someone who helps prepare communion, uh, we have a nice little like squirt thing that squirts the juice in there nicely. But if you want to be part of the team that would help with that, uh, it wouldn't, it, it's not hard. You just come a little bit early on Sunday morning and, you know, it, it'll take you half an hour at most to put together, you know, a couple trays of communion. I would love to talk with you about serving in that way. Uh, so you can either find me after church or, uh, as I said earlier, you can use one of your connect cards. Uh, on the back, there's a way that says, I'd like to serve at Westwood. Just check that box and write, uh, you know, communion on there and I will be in contact with you and, you know, Eventually, we won't have to deal with plastic wrappers at all, hopefully, and uh, we'll go back to kind of the way that we used to do it. Uh, so, uh, just to say that, please, if you're interested in serving in that way, let me know, and, uh, and, and we'll go from there. You can also, uh, you know, like I said earlier, put uh, prayer requests on that Connect card. Uh, drop those in the offering boxes on your way out the door today or get those to me. Uh, you can drop any gift, any tithe or offering that you have. You can put that in uh, those offering boxes as well. We are thankful for the way in which you support and, and partner with us here at Westwood uh, as we try to be a community that allows people to bring their pain, to bring what they're going through, and to experience the consolation of Christ uh, that comes through our faith. So thank you for the way in which you are helping us do that. A couple quick announcements before we go. Um, so this coming Saturday is the second Saturday of the month, which means that it's time for both um, our men's breakfast, which takes place about 7.30 in the morning is when that starts downstairs. And then Mug and Muffin starts at 9.30. If I have either of those times wrong, people, am I right? Okay, good. Uh, so uh, I always get up here and go, maybe I'm wrong. And uh, it's a good reminder that I'm human, just like you. And uh, so uh, put, we'd love for you to come uh, to one of those events, uh, you know, men's breakfast uh, in, at 7.30, mug and muffin uh, later. Um, and we'd love for you to be at those. Also, you'll see that the last one on the far right says church potluck. 
Uh, we are going to be, you know, we're working on bringing back fellowship events, uh, bringing back some opportunity for us just to spend time with each other. And of course, uh, I have heard many people say, I miss potlucks and I, I, I've been trying to figure it out. We're going we're gonna to try the next one uh, coming up here on October 23rd. Uh, that is the fourth Sunday in October because the next Sunday is like the weekend of Halloween and I'm still figuring out like what Madison does for Halloween, if it's in the afternoon on Sunday, whatever. So we're avoiding that weekend. I'd love for you to you know, bring some food to share that week. Uh, we're going to we'll, we'll have service as normal. And then after service, we'll go downstairs and experience some time of fellowship while we eat together um, and experience the fellowship, the gift of community that comes from our faith. So with all that said, uh, I would like to, uh, to read this passage from Romans. It's the same one that I used in my sermon today as a way to encourage us as we go into our week. Paul says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought of for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it is dependent on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, Never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not, overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. We'll see you next week.